Good evening and welcome to our webinar, The ABCs of Cancer Genetics. The topics that will be covered tonight are paramount to our community. As many as 90% of the millions of people who have an inherited mutation that causes or predisposes them to cancer are unaware of their risk. Join us in spreading awareness to your friends and family and shine the light on hereditary cancer to save lives. My name is Elise Boucher. I am a member of the FORCE community and I will be your moderator for this evening. FORCE improves the lives of millions of individuals and families facing hereditary breast, ovarian, pancreatic, prostate, colorectal, and endometrial cancers. Our community includes people with a BRCA, ATM, PALB2, CHECK2, and other inherited gene mutations and those diagnosed with Lynch syndrome. We accomplish the FORCE mission through our education, support, advocacy, and research efforts. No matter your inherited mutation or diagnosis, FORCE and our trained volunteers are available to help. Visit our website for expert reviewed information and access to our support programs, including virtual Zoom meetings, our peer navigation matching program, and our online message boards. It is my honor this evening to introduce our expert speaker, Dr. Lisa Medlinski, CGC. Dr. Medlinski has provided cancer genetic counseling services for over 25 years. She has practiced in the United States and Canada and was a founding member of the Familial Cancer Risk Group of the National Society of Genetic Counselors, establishing cancer genetic counseling as a subspecialty. Dr. Medlinski will address questions about specific genes that cause an increased risk of certain types of cancers and tackle concerns of people who have been diagnosed with or those that are at high risk for hereditary cancers. Dr. Medlinski will not be providing medical advice. And please reach out to your doctor if you have any specific or urgent questions. After her presentation, we will conduct a Q&A to answer the many questions that you have submitted today. Thank you so much for your participation. We will try to do our best to address each one. At this time, I would like to turn the floor over to Dr. Lablinski. Thank you very much, Elise, and uh, thank you to FORCE for the invitation to present to everyone today. Um, I am a big fan of this organization. I think um, FORCE does just an amazing job of support, education, advocacy, um, and I am delighted to, um, to do this presentation for you today. So let me just get my mouse set here. There we go. All right. So the main topics I'm going to cover today in this webinar are really sort of the basics about DNA. We are talking about inherited risk. And so understanding how our genes work and how mutations in our genes work to increase cancer risk, um, I think is really important for people to have an understanding of. It can help you make decisions about your healthcare. So we're gonna do a little bit of basic um, genetics, the basics of DNA. What is it? How does it work? Why is it important? Then we're gonna move into how mutations in DNA are related to cancer risk specifically, and how that information then ties into an individual's own personal level of cancer risk. Um, and then we're gonna do some uh, Q&A questions. Okay, so the basics of our DNA and our genes. So it's, it's really remarkable when you sit back and kind of big picture think, we are made up of trillions of individual little cells and each of those cells contains our genome, which is sort of like all of our DNA that we have. Um, and, you know, we're made up of all of these various parts, organs, bones, skin, brain, muscle, um, and each of those organs is made up of specific cell types, right? So muscles are made up of muscle cells, bone is made up of bone cells, et cetera. And inside each of those cells, there's a little part inside called the nucleus of the cell, and inside that is our DNA. And there are 
an estimated um, about 20,000 genes that are part of that DNA. This is made up of millions and millions of little pieces of information. And I like to think of each of our genes as like a little instruction manual for some function in our body. So there's a couple of examples here on this slide. One that people are usually familiar with is blood type. So you have a gene that is like a little instruction that determines what your blood type is going to be. Included in these 20,000 or so genes that make up our genome are genes that are related to cancer risk, and that's what I'm going to focus on. So you will probably notice in this list um, one or more genes that you've heard of. Maybe you've tested positive for one of these genes. Um, this is sort of the, the, the list of genes that we know the most about so far. There are many other genes that are related to cancer risk, um, but these are the ones that have been studied the longest and we kind of know the most about. I think of each of these genes as being instructions for some kind of repair protein that works in the cell and does little maintenance work inside your cell. So we know the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes are involved in repair functions. We know that some of these other genes are related in sort of regular cell maintenance work. So all of these genes that are throughout your genome um, that we ultimately know relate to cancer risk, the vast majority of them are fundamentally related to repair um, functions inside your cells. So they're important. We Some people call them housekeeping genes, um, but they that's the role that they serve. Okay. Um, there is an exception to this, but I'm not going to cover um, sex chromosomes today. The vast majority of your genome involves having two copies of each gene, one from mom and one from dad. And I like to think of our genome as like a big library of DNA. So if you think of each of the 20,000 genes as a manual, your genome is sort of like a library of those 20,000 genes copied, right? You have a big library from your mom, you have a big library from your dad. And in the example here, you know, you can imagine, oh, at this location in the genome, here's the manual that is the BRCA2 gene. And over here is the manual that we take off the shelf, um, and that's the MSH6 gene. Um, but this applies to all of these genes. So this could also be the CHEC2 or the PALB2. Um, basically, each of our genes has a known location in our genome. Okay, so those are the basics. I'm going to transition now and talk a little bit about how all of that basic information translates into cancer risk. So one important thing, um, I know I like knowing if I go for any kind of medical procedure or test, I always want to understand what are you doing? <laughs> You're taking a blood sample or a saliva sample or something's getting imaged. I, I'm a science nerd, so I like to understand exactly what's going on. Um, so I'm going to walk you through what actually is happening in the laboratory when you get a genetic test done. Genetic testing means that the lab is taking those books off the shelf, right? So in this example, this is a test for BRCA1 and BRCA2. The laboratory is able to use really fancy technology to kind of go into your genome and look at those instruction manuals specifically. So it's kind of like they're taking the BRCA1 and BRCA2 books off the shelf remember two of each, one from mom, one from dad, um, and they're sequencing them. I think this is like spell checking. They are literally going through the, the uh, way that the gene is made up and checking the spelling of the entire gene. So historically, you know, 20 years ago, this was typically the testing that was done for hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome. It was looking at these two genes, BRCA1 and BRCA2. For people who have Lynch syndrome, which is a condition that increases the risk of 
colorectal and endometrial cancer predominantly, but also some other cancers, there are four different genes that are tested. And now there's even an additional gene that's sort of right next to one of these. So it's kind of like taking four books off the shelf to test for Lynch syndrome. And what is becoming more and more common now in genetic testing is what we call a multi-gene test or a panel test. And this is the equivalent of taking any number of books off the shelf and checking them um, simultaneously. So looking at all of these different genes for mutations. So in my clinic, typically if I'm testing a young woman who has a new diagnosis of breast cancer, I have a panel of 15 genes that I typically order. That includes BRCA1 and BRCA2, but it may also include a lot of these other genes like ATM, CHEK2, PALB2. And you know, some labs use sort of a set panel um, that is the panel that covers the, the most number of genes. Um, other genes or other labs have um, panels that are disease specific. So for example, they might have a breast panel, a colon panel, an ovarian panel. And the genes that are on these various panels are the ones that have been determined um, in most cases to have a relationship to an increased risk of that type of cancer. Um, there are also what we call pan cancer panels, and these are typically the really huge panels that have um, you know, anywhere up to 200 genes on them in some cases. And those are looking at kind of any gene that has ever been discovered that may have a relationship with cancer risk. They're not always proven. Um, so sometimes they're a little bit more experimental. And in my case, I also like to customize these. So I tend to work with labs where I can actually customize my own panel according to which mutations or you know which genes I think might go along with a particular patient and their family history. Okay. So what happens in the lab? Um, if we think about someone who is getting genetic testing and they have two BRCA2 genes, one they got from mom and one they got from dad, um, that don't have any mutations, so they would have a sort of a normal result for BRCA2. Um, in the lab, they are basically spell checking that whole instruction manual. They are going through letter by letter in that gene to see if they see any spelling mistakes. There's only four letters in our genetic alphabet, A, C, G, and T, and those stand for the four molecules that make up DNA. So anytime you see something relating to a genetic sequence or genetic testing, what you'll see is something relating to these four letters. If you've ever heard of the movie Gattaca, it's also where the movie title comes from. It's a word made up of those four letters. Um, so when they do genetic testing in the lab, they are sequencing both copies of your gene, the one you got from mom and the one you got from dad. And in this case, we see that the sequence is normal. There's nothing unusual there. In this example, the lab has found a mutation. So you'll see the top BRCA2 gene, the sequence looks fine. In the lower BRCA2 gene, there's a mutation. And in this case, the mutation is a deletion of about seven of these letters. The mutations that we find in these cancer genes can be as small as a single letter that's been substituted. Sometimes we see a couple of letters that have been deleted or extra letters that have been inserted. Sometimes the whole gene is deleted. Um, and so a mutation can be very small or it can be very, very large. And the technology that's used in laboratories to sequence genes um, is really aiming to catch all of these various types of mutations that can occur. So again, it's like spell checking um, to see is the spelling of this instruction manual or this gene, is it correct? Or do we see a spelling error um, or is there a chapter ripped out of the book, for example? So there's a wide variety of errors um, and mutations that can be detected when we do genetic testing. <clears throat> 
it's this spelling that actually leads to inside the cell the creation of that little repair protein that's going around in the cell and doing its re repair function. So someone who has two working copies or two correctly spelled copies of the BRCA2 gene is going to have um, you know, sort of the typical amount of BRCA2 protein working in that cell to do its repair job. If we have someone who has a mutation in the BRCA2 gene, then what we see is that they have, they still have the working BRCA2 protein in the cell from the parent that did not pass on a mutation, um, but they don't have as much of that protein doing its job. There's only one instead of two. And this is probably one of the most important concepts in understanding cancer risk. Okay, so this is an example of a genetic test report that indicates that this particular patient has a mutation in the BRCA1 gene. There's a lot of language that is used to describe these mutations. Sometimes you'll see the word pathogenic. Sometimes you'll see the word deleterious. Um, they all mean the same thing. It means there's a mutation, and we know that this particular mutation causes this manual, this gene, to not function properly and to not make its repair protein correctly. So in this example, the specific mutation that's on the test report says C.68 through 69 del AG. And everybody who has a positive test, you can go look on your report and see what is the little code. What this means is that in the BRCA1 gene, let's pretend this is you know, the, the right numbering, um, at position 68 and position 69, in the regular sequence, there's supposed to be an A and a G. And in someone who has this mutation, the del means deleted. Those two letters are missing. So that's exactly the kind of spell checking that is happening when someone gets genetic testing. And when they find a mutation, the way that it is reported on the test report is, is literally showing you the spelling change that occurred. This is a way to find people you might be related to, actually, um, who share the same mutation. Um, it's also often a way that we can understand how to very accurately test family members. If we know exactly what that mutation is, any blood relative can go and find out, well, do I have that mutation or do I not have the mutation? And it's very accurate testing. Okay. One question that I get asked about a lot because they're very common with these larger multi-gene panel tests now is the dreaded variant of uncertain significance or the variant of unknown significance. We call these a VUS. The labs don't like them. Your doctors and genetic counselors don't like them. Patients don't like them because it really means, well, we saw a spelling change in, in one of the genes, but we don't really know if it is a mutation or is it just variation from person to person that has no consequence. And so the analogy I use for this is the spelling of the word gray, right? I'm Canadian and so, you know, I've, I can spell the word gray, G-R-A-Y or G-R-E-Y. At the end of the day, it really doesn't matter. Everyone kind of recognizes that those are both two acceptable ways to spell the word gray. Um, and so we know in, you know, we look at, at, at humanity, we are not all clones of each other. We do not all have the exact same DNA sequence in all of our genes. There is variability in our genes that has no medical consequence. And so there's a lot of spelling changes that will not make it onto a genetic test report because we know they're completely fine. It's, it's a variant that's okay. We don't need to report it. So these are two both acceptable ways to spell this. If we go to the bottom line, we see, wait a minute, this sentence doesn't make any sense. These aren't words. This is, this is not correct. A laboratory seeing something like that would say, this is definitely a mutation. We know that this does not lead to the correct repair protein in the cell. Where things get tricky, and this is particularly for a lot of the um, 
genes that have been added to panels more recently where we just don't have large amounts of data to work with to know are these little changes actually something that increases cancer risk or is this just normal variation and we shouldn't even report it when the lab finds something like that and i've used an example here because greh isn't a word but if you say it out loud it sounds like gray so maybe it's okay but maybe it isn't we just don't have the data to know the standard of care in medical practice is that we do not make any medical recommendations based on these and that's because historically as more research gets done most vus turn out to be normal human variation not mutations and so we would never want to do things like recommend surgeries or excessive screening or medical interventions for something that you know two years later turns out to be nothing of importance um, and so that's the standard of care so just to make people aware of that when we get a VUS um, we typically do not recommend taking any medical action on it instead we make recommendations based on the person's personal medical history and their family medical history okay so just to recap that section um, we know that our genome is all of our genes that's about 20,000 genes we have two copies of pretty much every gene we got one from mom and we got one from dad everybody's genome is unique the exception is identical twins who came from the same original egg and sperm cell they do have the same genome um, but other than that exception everyone has their own unique genome and each sequence can have variations meaning your all of your little instruction manuals in your genome are going to have their own unique way of being spelled and that's okay when we see a mutation in a gene that is meaning that there is actually an error in the instruction manual and it can't be read and you cannot get that repair protein um, developing properly and so you are missing one or it's not functioning correctly and so when a lab does genetic testing they are spell checking those little manuals those little genes to see if they see an error or a mutation and then when you get your report back it will say exactly what is the spelling error that they detected if they found one? Okay. And then um, the, the last section before we get into some questions is thinking through how do these mutations, you know, because it's a little abstract, right? These tiny little spelling errors in the DNA of a cell, how does that actually lead to normal cells turning into cancer cells? and so a way to think about this is we know that our cells are constantly growing and dividing right so a cell divides into two new cells they divide into two new cells and so on and so on so our old cells die off our new cells replace them so you can think of this as though our library is inside those cells is being copied over and over and over again from the moment we are conceived and we are just one single cell with our whole genome that gets copied into two cells and then that gets copied into four and so on and so on and so our whole library is getting copied trillions and trillions of times over throughout our lifetime and when that copying is accurate, we see the same DNA sequence. It wouldn't matter if we took, you know, like a little saliva sample from a newborn baby and sequenced it and then, you know, waited 80 years and then sequenced that same person. Um, we would see that, you know, they have the same basic um, genetic sequence that has been there through their, through their whole life. So they're, you know, the copying has worked correctly. With cancer development, what can happen, and this is happening, you know, at, at a rate that is, is something that's happening as our cells are just naturally growing and dividing, it's not a perfect process. Errors do get made in that copying every time something happens. And so, you know, it might be that a cell starts out with the usual DNA sequence and then a mutation happens not one you were born with, but one that happened as an error in that copying process. 
Now that new sequence of this particular um, gene or you know, wherever the, the mutation happens to be, that will get passed on to all the descendants of that cell that had that mutation. Meanwhile, you know, cells that don't have that mutation will continue on um, growing and dividing. And this is something that is really related to just, you know, regular cellular copying. Um, there are things that increase the mutation rate. So one example that we always use is thinking about smoking and risk of lung cancer. We know that there's carcinogens that create a higher chance of these new mutations happening, and that can create an increased cancer risk. Um, and a, a little bit of nomenclature here, a little bit of, of vocabulary. We call the sequence that you were born with your germline sequence. Germ cells are egg cells and sperm cells, and so your germline is what was your sequence at that moment that you were conceived? What's the DNA you got from mom and you got from dad? And that is sort of your starting point, right? On the other hand, those errors that occur when your cells are growing and dividing as you go through life, those are called acquired mutations or somatic mutations. They are not part of your inherited DNA. So this, in this figure, we can see an example of Here's the germline at the top that started out, and then the cell grew and divided. One of them was completely fine, and the other one had an acquired or somatic mutation that now gets passed on. So this can get a little bit complicated, of course, but when you think about this happening on a scale of trillions and trillions of cell divisions, we call this, you know, the first time it happens in a cell, we might call that the first hit. And then if the other copy of that same gene gets knocked out, we call that the second hit. And I'm gonna go through that in a little bit more detail, but what can happen is if that cell acquires enough mutations in its DNA, now that housekeeping and repair that's supposed to be happening in the cell is no longer happening, and that normal cell can become a cancer cell and one of the key features of cancer cells is that they don't have that growth program um, functioning in sort of a regular routine way. We know cancer cells grow and divide faster than normal cells do. So if the maintenance work isn't being done in the cell because of these acquired errors, a, a normal cell can become a cancer cell and become the beginning of a tumor. So if we think about this back to our repair worker analogy, if you have two copies of a gene, and I'll use BRCA2 as the example here, that are working, their sequence is fine, there's no mutations, they make the appropriate repair protein, and you have both of those in the cell doing that maintenance work. And so for the vast majority of cancers, most people don't have a germline mutation or an inherited mutation um, that they were born with. But most cancers are because of these acquired somatic mutations that happen over a lifetime. This is why the vast majority of cancer risk occurs after the age of 60. We acquire these mutations as we age in our cells. So, you know, you start off with both repaired proteins, you acquire one mutation, and then possibly you acquire the second mutation. Now you don't have any BRCA2 protein working in the cell, and that cell can become a cancer cell. For someone who has an inherited mutation in one of these genes, that means you actually are starting off at birth, at life, with one mutation in every one of the cells of your body. And so instead of having two that can be mutated and lost, you're only starting out with one. And this is why in people who have an in inherited cancer risk, one of the features we see often is a younger age of diagnosis. Often the age of diagnosis of cancers for people with a germline or an inherited mutation um, is typically maybe 20 years younger than the average age of diagnosis for that particular cancer. That's not true for all cancers or all genes, but in general, um, 
you know, that's one of the things that we see. So for someone who has an inherited mutation, we know the risk of getting cancer is shifted to a younger age because it doesn't take a whole lifetime necessarily to acquire all of the mutations that can occur. We also see that the risks of cancer are higher than they are for the average person. Um, and that's kind of a statistical um, finding that makes sense, right? If, if you only have one working repair protein per cell to work with, the probability of losing that second copy, it's not 100%, it's not 0%, it's somewhere in between, um, but it's going to be a lot higher than the typical person who does not have a germline mutation in one of these genes. So to recap that section, um, our cells are constantly growing and dividing. Throughout our lifetime, we are always acquiring mutations in the DNA of our, DNA of our cells. And so we're getting new spelling errors in our instruction manuals that we were not born with. We acquire them. Um, but because we have two copies of each gene, it's actually fine. If you lost one, this other guy can still do the repair process that needs to be done in the cell. It's only when that second one is lost that now there's the potential for cancer to develop. Um, people who were born with a germline mutation only have one of those repair workers in each cell as opposed to two. So the risk is higher and the age of diagnosis is often younger. Okay. And then um, the last little section here, you know, this is sort of, well, how do we take all of this information about cell biology and turn it into information about how do I make medical decisions to understand what is my personal level of risk? And this is an area where we know a whole lot more than we used to, but we still really have a long way to go. So I've made this really complicated slide, not to alarm anyone, but to kind of show you, I have really oversimplified the cell biology process so far. Um, what's really happening is that all of these different genes and proteins are interacting. They're forming complexes. Sometimes you need you know, four or five of these different proteins to all work together to do their maintenance work in the cell. Um, and each of them sort of has a different specific task. And in some cases, we can tolerate mutations that are very mild because the rest of that complex is able to do the repair work. You know, it's kind of like if you think of um, a, a team of maintenance workers in a building and there's, you know, that one worker that's kind of on, on lunch a lot longer or isn't really doing their part, the other ones can still pick up the slack and repair can function properly. Um, that's happening in our cells too. We can actually tolerate a lot of variation in our genes that make these proteins. Um, what this also means, it kind of helps us to understand like why does this gene give a really high risk of a particular cancer, but this other gene, you know, just slightly increases the risk. This has to do with, you know, how critical is each protein in that repair process? can think of some of them as sort of part-time workers that only come in sometimes, and others are like the managers that have to organize all the other repair proteins. So it's very complicated. And one of the things I always want to point out that I think FORCE does such a wonderful job of is saying, look, the stuff we know that there has been studied for years and we have really high quality evidence to the point where we feel comfortable saying, People with this mutation should consider doing these medical interventions, um, screening, surgery, medication changes, you know, whatever it is, um, because there's been enough research done to say we feel confident about this, that these things will matter. And so anytime you see a force presentation, it'll have a little icon saying this is an evidence-based guideline, or alternatively, we don't quite have the data out yet. We don't have the, the evidence um, for this particular finding or this recommendation. So the BRCA1 and 2 genes and the Lynch syndrome genes, they were discovered back in the early 90s. And so we've had, you know, decades now of, of research to have a good understanding of what are these levels of risk. 
that go with these genes. Conversely, there are genes, the genes aren't newer, we've always had them in our DNA, but our understanding of them is newer. So BARD1, BRIP1, NBN, RAD51, C and D are a few examples of genes that are more recent additions to genetic testing. And in some cases, there might only be 20 or 30 families worldwide that have been found to have mutations in these genes. So we don't have decades worth of knowledge and research to understand um, what the exact risks are. This is frustrating for patients who want to know, like, what is my risk if I have a mutation in this gene? And we have to be honest and you know, look you in the eye and say, well, one early study you know, indicates that there's probably a higher risk of breast cancer, but we don't know how much higher. And we don't really know the ages yet at which the risk is is most um, you know mostly increased. So this can be really frustrating. But I strongly recommend anyone who has the opportunity to participate in a research study, if you have a mutation in one of these genes, that's how we get the answers faster. So I, I encourage you to consider participating if you can. Okay. This is an example of, you know, what are these levels of risk and how does it vary by gene or mutation? I intentionally did not put numbers on this because it actually is different for every individual depending on a lot of factors. But for example, if you have a mutation in the BRCA1 gene, we know that that is one of the genes that increases the risk of breast cancer the most. It's a, considered a high risk gene. Check two, on the other hand, we consider a moderate risk gene because the risk of breast cancer in people who carry a check two mutation is not as high as it is for BRCA1. And then digging down even further, you can have different mutations in those genes that give different levels of risk. So here's one mutation in check two that increases the risk of breast cancer by about two or three times. This particular change in check two maybe doubles the risk, not much higher than that. And so this is why it's really important if you get a genetic test report back and it has fancy graphs and you know in information and it 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 implies that your risk of cancer is 86% or 52% or what have you, please do consider getting a personalized risk assessment from a cancer genetics expert because that's not necessarily true for everyone. We know that your age is very much an important piece of information in terms of understanding what your risk is, which gene, which mutation. What about the rest of your medical history? Those are things that make your personal risk go up or down. So there's really no one answer to the question, what is the risk of cancer with this gene? It's very, very personalized and a lot goes into thinking through that. Another example is with Lynch syndrome. Remember earlier I mentioned there's these four, um, four different genes that all cause Lynch syndrome, but the level of risk differs depending on which gene your mutation is in. We know MSH2 and MLH1 have the highest risk. MSH6 is sort of in between, and PMS2 mutations, those patients seem to have lower levels of risk. And again, there's all these different factors that help us give you personalized recommendations for how often should you be screening, when should you start, what age should my family members consider testing. So it ends up being very, very personal. Okay, so to recap this last section, um, there are a lot of these proteins working together like a whole maintenance crew inside your cells. And if a critical protein is completely broken or it's missing, then we know the damage can accumulate faster and a normal cell can turn into a cancer cell. And the probability of that cancer developing depends on a whole lot of factors. Which gene, which mutation, how old are you, what are the other things in your medical history or personal history that might influence the risk of particular types of cancer. And um, plug for cancer genetic counselors, but this is what we do. We take that information, personalize it, and go through what is the evidence that tells us there could be benefit from doing 
um, following a particular medical recommendation? And when don't we have the evidence? And then we have to kind of make our best informed decision together. Okay, so I'm gonna pause there. Thank you so much, Dr. Medlinski. That was an incredibly informative presentation. The way you presented everything was so clear. And I know that our community is going to walk away with a lot of information that they didn't have prior to attending tonight. So thank you very much. Um, as you can imagine, we have many questions coming tonight, pre-submitted questions, and then live here. We are going to try to get through a big number of them. Um, if your question was not answered, though, we will be following up with you. So let's just dive right in. So our first question is, how different is genetic testing on tumor tissue from testing on blood? Okay. Um, and this was a wonderful pre-submitted question, and this is one that comes up a lot and causes a lot of confusion for cancer patients who are um, currently getting treatment or they're in the phase where they're planning their treatment and there's a lot of testing, a lot of imaging, a lot of appointments. It's, it can be a very um, you know, difficult and, and, and um, challenging time just because there's so much going on. And so sometimes patients will say, I think they did genetic testing, but then they said it, it was only my tumor. I'm not sure what that means. So, the, the way that this works, and I'm going to use a couple of graphics to walk you through. So remember your germline or your original cells that you started off with. Germline testing is usually done on a blood sample or a saliva sample. And everyone always asks, is saliva as accurate as blood? It is because when we test saliva, we're actually taking white blood cells out of your saliva sample. So whether we get those white blood cells from your saliva or your blood, doesn't matter. But that's your original DNA, that's what we're testing. If we do tumor profiling, and there's a couple of different ways to do this, then what they're doing is actually looking at the tumor tissue itself, the cells that make up the tumor, and that is looking at predominantly the acquired mutations. The reason is that a lot of times um, there might be a targeted drug or a clinical trial um, where the information about which are the specific mutations in that tumor um, and can we target them. Now your germline is going to be mixed in with that and there are some ways where they can do testing that kind of separates them out and says this is germline result and this is tumor result. But the focus of tumor profiling is really to find what are the specific mutations that led to the development of that cancer that have a match that allow us to give you a certain treatment? Um, so tumor biopsy is sort of what I just explained. It's looking at all of those mutations in the tumor cells. Mostly those are the acquired mutations, but sometimes there can be germline stuff mixed in. And we want to understand, do we have a drug that takes advantage of the fact that those mutations follow this particular pattern. Another way that a lot of oncologists are using now to track um, recurrence um, and in the future might actually be used as a screening tool to find cancers early, although we're not quite there yet, is called liquid biopsy. This is looking for tiny pieces of DNA that have been shed from tumor cells and are just floating around in the bloodstream. So they're not inside a cell, this is often called circulating tumor DNA or cell-free DNA. Um, and if those little pieces of DNA carry mutations that we know were in the tumor sample, it can be used to track recurrence. Um, germline testing is using blood or saliva to get at those white blood cells to understand what was your original genetic sequence. Now, an important thing to know, if you have a blood cancer like a leukemia or a lymphoma, or if you've had a bone marrow transplant from a donor, then we have to actually use some other tissue. Usually we do a skin biopsy in that case to get at your original DNA, because if you've had um, leukemia or a bone marrow transplant, your white blood cells no longer represent your original DNA. So those are the different um, types of testing. Excellent, thank you. So this audience member wrote in, if I have only been tested for BRCA1 and 2 and tested positive for BRCA2 mutation, should I have more genetic testing? So there's not one 
definite answer to this question. And when I have patients that I counseled many, many years ago who I encourage them to check in every few years, is there anything new that I should, you know, be learning about? Is there, are there any new recommendations? Things to consider if you already know that you have a mutation, um, but you're thinking about, well, there's all this new stuff, should I consider it? Number one, are the cancers in my family explained by, by my results so far? So for example, if this particular person who is watching and submitted the question about, you know, I have BRCA2 um, and I already know that, if they have maybe on the other side of the family, three relatives who've all had colon cancer or uterine cancer or different kinds of cancers um, that are not related to the side of the family that we know the BRCA2 came from, um, then it can absolutely be worth talking about if there's additional genetic testing that might make sense. Um, there are people out there who have two different mutations. Um, it's rare, but it absolutely happens, especially now that we're testing more and more genes in these large multi-panel genes, in multi-panel tests. Um, and so it, it doesn't happen often, but it can happen where you have two things going on. Um, the other thing is, do I meet the criteria for a different genetic test? Um, most of these tests have sort of a set of criteria that helps us work with patients to figure out, does it make sense to do this test? Is this likely to find anything? Or is this just sort of generic general testing out of interest, but it's not really medically indicated? And that gets to the last thing, which is, is this going to change my medical care? So for example, um, sometimes people who have an advanced cancer um, and they're looking for clinical trials, they're looking for treatments, and maybe they already know they have a BRCA mutation and they're wondering if there's anything else they should be looking at. Germline testing or doing you know, the, the, the traditional saliva or blood test isn't likely to give you more information. In that case, tumor profiling is really gonna be the thing that is more likely to help somebody find a treatment. So all of these things are worth considering um, in thinking about if it, it makes sense to go back and do additional germline testing. Thank you, that makes perfect sense and very thorough answer. This next audience member has a CHECK2 genetic mutation and wants to know, are there different cancer risks and different degrees of risk depending on which variant you have? Yeah, so this one, um, this is coming up more and more, and that's because as genetic testing is becoming more and more available, um, more insurance companies are covering it, um, and the panels are getting bigger and bigger. We are learning so much more about how these cancer genes work, and I touched on this a little earlier in the talk with CHECK2 as the example, um, but I'm going to go through it in a little bit more detail. So here are these two different CHECK2 mutations. One of them, if we go back and remember our little alphabet that gets reported on the report, is called 1100 del C. This is probably found in about half a percent to one percent of people who have um, Western European ancestry or in Central European ancestry as well. Um, S428F is a mutation that is a Jewish founder mutation among people who have Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry. This is different to the BRCA1 and BRCA2 founder mutations, um, but the same premise is there. There was some ancestor generations and generations ago where this mutation occurred and got passed on to that population. So these are two that we actually see on reports fairly frequently. We know that people with the 1100 del C have higher breast cancer risks than people with the 428F. And Part of this gets into this idea of what we call penetrance. We call a high penetrance mutation, a mutation that has a high probability of causing the cancer. A low penetrance mutation means there's a lower probability. And so some other words that I mentioned before, like pathogenic or deleterious, those mean, if you see that on a report, we think that the protein the, you know, the worker, the maintenance worker is not really functional at all. If we see the word low penetrance on a report, that means, well, this one might have a milder effect and it might be still able to do some of that maintenance or repair work. So 
visually what that can look like is this. So if up at the top here, this is what we think of as the normal check to sequence. And for example, up here, there's a C and down here, there's a C, these are in blue. The 1100 del C mutation is like this. This is what you'd see on the report. That letter C is missing. When this gets translated into that check to repair worker protein, it does not work. It doesn't make the, the repair protein correctly. So that risk is a little bit higher. With the 428, this is a substitution. Up in this area where there's normally a C, instead there's a T. And so there is still some check two um, protein floating around. It just might not work as well. So this is where we're really starting to learn a lot more about how these um, specific mutations within a gene actually work and influence individual risks of cancer. Excellent. So, you know, you speak to there are more and more testing options, more panels. Um, this question falls into that vein. Can ancestry testing, ancestry testing provide accurate test results now that they're available? Some companies say they are doing BRCA testing. Yeah, this is another very common question. And our, our little instruction manual spell checking works perfectly for this. So when you get tested in a medical laboratory where a medical laboratory director is reviewing the sequencing results and signing their name on it and saying, here is your report. That's, we call that medical grade testing. They are doing full sequencing. They are spell checking every letter in the genes that have had testing ordered. So if I order a 15 gene panel, they are spell checking each of those genes twice, both your mom and your dad copy, um, and they're looking at every letter in those instruction manuals or every, every molecule in those books. Ancestry testing is kind of looking at a couple of letters per book. So this is very different. And one of the most important things we have concerns about with people thinking that ancestry testing is a substitute for medical testing if ancestry testing finds a mutation, it's possible that that's correct. It has absolutely found people who have BRCA mutations and Lynch syndrome mutations, but they have also made errors in making those calls. I myself have had people come in who say, I've got a BRCA mutation on my, you know, whichever ancestry type of test they did. We run it in a clinical lab and they actually do not. So it can be wrong. But it can be correct, and so it's something that is worth checking out. The bigger worry to me is that people kind of walk away thinking, oh, good news, I don't have a mutation. I did my testing and it was negative. This was not full testing. And most people have what we call a unique or a private mutation, meaning there might only be a handful of people around the world that have that same mutation as you. And if it's in a part of the book that they're not spell checking, you didn't get tested for it. So we really feel strongly that it is not a substitute. And um, when the FDA approved some of these tests, or they didn't really approve the test, they approved that the lab could give that information back to people who were purchasing these products. In the fine print of the FDA, FDA approval, it says specifically, this needs to be confirmed in a medical lab. And now insurance companies have actually started writing this in as um, something they will pay for because the stakes are high and we don't want to get it wrong. Excellent. So I think a lot of people are going to leave this presentation today wishing they could talk to you every single day, <laughs> have an open line of communication with you. And they're thinking about not only themselves, but generations to follow. So I think the big question is here, you know, how does someone stay up to date on the latest mutations identified that could impact cancer and where will they find the resources to continue to access this information? Yeah, this is a great question. There's not necessarily one place, um, but to me, the thing I always recommend is checking in with the clinic where you had your testing done. Um, 
because that you already have a connection there they can you know definitely see if there's any updates that that apply to you this is especially important for people who have had testing with a VUS you want to make sure that whatever lab you were tested at knows where to send an updated report one really great thing that most of the labs do that do this testing is if there's an update in a VUS so now they know this is really a mutation or this is a, a you know just variation we don't need to report it they will reissue your report and it's important that you get that information that's been updated the report that's revised will always go to who ordered the test in the first place people move doctors retire you change clinics um, so it's important to let the lab know hey if there's any revisions for my VUS can you please send them to this doctor um, anybody you go to see as a new healthcare provider can also contact the lab and I do this multiple times a year I call and say hey I've got um, this patient sitting here, here's their information, they've signed a release form, can you please release any updates to me? Um, and they're happy to do that. For advanced genetics users out there, there are databases that you can look at. I don't recommend digging into these for the average person because it's data, they're databases. Um, but if you know your way around a genetics database, there are a couple of places that you can look that I've, I've noted here. Excellent. And so we did have one last question that I wanted to make sure that came through tonight in it because I think, you know, what a wonderful answer to provide all of those resources. I think another thing that people crave, maybe the largest thing beyond knowledge is a sense of community support interaction. Um, and you had spoken earlier about how, you know, mutations like BRCA1 and 2 have been studied for so long. This person wants to know, I haven't found an expert or a community of experts for ATM, the way there is for BRCA or other well-known specific mutations. Any suggestions for how to find a specific place of expertise for those like me? Right, so for expertise, I, I tend to be partial to academic medical centers that have um, a cancer genetics um, clinic or cancer genetics expertise. Depending where you live, that's not always accessible or available, but there are now a lot of telehealth genetic counselors um, that have expertise in cancer genetics. So one thing I do wanna put a plug in for FORCE because the other idea of community and where do I find other people that have mutations in the same gene, um, FORCE has always been there for families with BRCA1 and BRCA2. And now, if you have not gone to the website, it's had this beautiful, incredible upgrade and now has information for people with ATM, CHECK2, PALB2, Lynch syndrome, P10, all the genes that are on you know, most of these multi-gene panels. So it's a wonderful place to get updated, accurate information. I tell all of my patients who have a positive test to sign up for the newsletters because that is a great way to learn about new research studies. It's a great way to learn about new results that have come out, political action that you can take to advocate for families that have these mutations. It, it's just amazing. So if nothing else, sign up for the newsletters, but there's also a lot of really good information and opportunities to connect with other, I always call them like distant, distant cousins, but you can find other people who have um, mutations in the same gene as you and kind of feel like I'm, I'm this is rare but I, I there are other people out there who have this same thing and I they can relate to what I'm talking about well thank you so much uh, Dr. Malinsky that is going to wrap our Q&A discussion thank you to everyone who submitted questions we were able to move through some of them as noted earlier if we didn't get to your question we will follow up by email um, and just thank you so much. I think everybody is going to walk away tonight wanting to share this presentation with everybody. It has been recorded. We will be sending it out. It will be available in 24 hours. So you can go back and access it, rewatch, relearn the information as many times as you need to. So thank you so much, Dr. Malinsky. My pleasure. Thank you. So at this time, we would just like to say a quick thank you for our sponsors for helping to bring this program to you. And if you enjoyed tonight's presentation, please visit our website to view past recorded FORCE webinars and to receive more information on upcoming FORCE virtual events. 
um, please continue to reach out to FORCE for your support and information needs. As Dr. Belinsky just so graciously mentioned, um, while there are many mutations and many cancers, there is just one community, the FORCE community, that supports anyone who is impacted by them. So thank you so much for attending. Continue to reach out to us and have a great night, everybody.